just honor Susan B. with this next song. Watch the cord. Watch the cord. almost 6,000 local groups pushing to stop the Trump administration and to build a progressive agenda for 2018 and beyond. Our ties to the Women's March are strong. Our 6,000 groups are mostly led by women. Many of these groups are formed on buses coming back from the DC Women's March last year. Indivisible Rochester hosts speakers on the third Tuesday of every month and is active, actively engaged in the community. 
Our theme for 2018 is all things voting. You can find us on Facebook, sign up over here at our Indivisible Rochester table, or send an email to indivisiblerochester at gmail.com. We have a fantastic lineup for speakers today, and we are so pleased to have you join us. We are all in this boat together, and together we are truly greater than the sum of our parts. I have a letter to kick us off from U.S. Representative Louise Slaughter, who couldn't be with, here with us today. Yay. Dear friends, as each of you and like-minded others gather today all across this nation, your voices are being heard in every corner of our democracy as you reignite the flame of civic engagement. Your voice and your vote matter. They are the most important tools that we citizens have to protect the institutions that are the bedrock of our democracy. I commend you for actively participating in our democracy and making your voice heard. However, voicing your concerns is only part of the commitment that is needed. You must register to vote and access the ballot box without fail. Our 2016 election saw 58% of voters go to the polls. A poll done by Pew Research was released last year and it ranked the United States 27th out of the 35 of the most developed countries when it came to voter turnout. Our voter participation is appalling. With voter turnout far below most democracies, it's clear we need to make changes and get people engaged in voting. When you exercise your right to vote and make your voice heard, you are doing your part. Congress must also do its part and clear the way for the ballot box for all Americans. To that end, I've introduced H.R. 1094, the Weekend Voting Act. This legislation would move Election Day to Saturday and Sunday in order to make it easier for working people and parents to make it to the polls. My friends, I call upon everyone here today to contact family members and friends who live in other states and encourage them to encourage their member of Congress to sign on to H.R. 1094, which will expand opportunities for innumerable Americans to exercise their right to vote on Election Day. If there is ever a doubt that one vote makes a difference, let us consider the 2017 Virginia state election. After a recount, the House of Delegates race was determined to be a tie. Amazingly, the winner of the seat was selected by picking a name out of a bowl. This lottery not only determined who would hold this assembly seat, it determined which party controlled the state house. One vote is all it would have taken to decide this election according to the will of the people. Your vote is your voice, and civic engagement is how you let elected officials know what's important to you. Now, more than ever, we need your voices to be heard. March on and make sure your voice is heard now and at the ballot box. Sincerely, Louise M. Slaughter. Our first speaker today is Aman Abin. Aman is the director of the Genesee Valley Chapter of the American Civil Liberties Union. She graduated from Rochester Institute of Technology in 2015 with a degree in political science. That year, Aman was named a woman to watch by the Democrat Chronicle. Aman served as campaign manager and deputy field director for several upstate New York representatives. She writes for MuslimGirl.com and last year was chosen as a city and state rising star recipient. Aman will be our guest on March 20th at our monthly Indivisible Rochester get-together. Please welcome Aman Abid. Good morning. <laughs> it's chilly, but it's not so bad out today. I'm so glad to see so many of you. I want to begin by saying, and not to be quite frank, but I feel like I was just standing here yesterday. This long winded journey over the course of the past year has taken literally everything I have out of me. A large part of my job has been trying to center the narrative and stories of those who have been impacted most. As you continue to hear the cries of the wife whose husband was shoved to the ground by the police, or the tears you see falling down a mother's face as her infant was taken away as she was led by ice towards her deportation, 
or the sincereness and love that the young transgender boy wants to feel from his teachers, students, and community. You ask yourself nearly every day if what you are doing is ever enough, if this is ever going to end, and if we are always going to feel this way. We are so fortunate to have the wave of activism that started last January, but we can never forget the issues that the people in this very state and this very city have faced. While we may not see it around us, the policing state still exists in highly concentrated areas of poverty in the city of Rochester, where, when, where men and women of color make up the demographics. This community has faced some of the highest rates of police brutality and arrest. Bail is set at unprecedented amounts for both juveniles and, adu and adults. And the conditions that these civilians are in while in jail, in cases like Rikers and Attica, are still not set up in a way to bring them back into society, but feed them back into the criminal justice system. Nearly 35,000 New Yorkers currently on parole, with approximately 10,000 individuals per year released from prison on parole each year, still don't have the right to vote. The health of our democracy, our neighborhood institutions, and our families depend on the active participation of its citizens. We must support the successful transition from incarceration to becoming a part of society once more. We must urge our senators to give these individuals to get their right to vote. Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> we have to remind our educators, our school systems, our board of education, and our city that they have a duty to ensure a proper public education for the thousands of students attending the Rochester City School District. A recent report released back in November outlined the inadequate resources available for students with disabilities. Have we not failed our students and the families of our own community if we send them off to school every day without a sustainable and proper education? I'll answer that for you. Yeah, we have, because we have, and we must fight to ensure that education is the foundation to a thriving society. I come from a family of Palestinians, where the opportunity in my mother's home country are scarce, and the education is dependent on the war surrounding them. The dreams are nothing short of what we all envision growing up in the United States, but what the road to opportunity for women who dream of an education and career are so limited. I have been attacked nearly every day for the religion I chose to follow, and my president has criminalized not one or two of us, but the, he chose to criminalize nearly every Muslim community, and attacks to Muslims' community continue to rise. My heart has been weak since January 27th, as the first Muslim ban was planned to be put into action. Every version of the ban has been found unconstitutional and illegal, and it is the duty of the Supreme Court to put an end to President Trump's attempt to undermine the constitutional guarantee of religious equality and the basic principles of our immigration laws. As we stand here today, our government has been shut down for nearly 12 hours, and young immigrants' lives are futures, and futures are at stake. We cannot afford to wait any longer. Our current state of affairs reflects the President's deeply destructive vision. We must hold our Congress members responsible to overcome the dysfunction and deliver us a solution. Congress must stand up for the dreamers who are here working and obtaining an education in places like the University of Rochester and RIT. I remind you all of this because it's important to recognize that this fight isn't over. We must scream the names of people like Erica Garner who lost her life at 27 because of what we as an institution put her and her family through. That woman may have been saved had her father had the opportunity to take another breath. The NYCLU has made a firm commitment to defend and promote the fundamental principles and values embodied in the Bill of Rights. I urge you to keep on having these conversations, to lobby and to push for legislation that will benefit all of New Yorkers and the marginalized communities that exist in this country. We must invest in our youth. Look what wonders can happen when we invest time into electing proper leaders and building more inclusive institutions. St. Paul, Minnesota elected its first ever black mayor in the city's history, Melvin Carter. In Charlotte, North Carolina, the city council is now majority millennial, with six out of seven members being younger than the age of 40. And in places like Virginia, Daniel Rome became the first openly transgender state representatives. But in an additional wave of historic firsts, Virginia also elected the first out lesbian to the House of De Delegates, the first two Latinx women, and the first a Af Asian American women. This is our time. Re-energize, restart, but most
most importantly, resist. Thank you so much, Mom. Our next speaker, Gabriela Quintanilla, is with the Rural and Migrant Ministry. She was born in El Salvador and came to the U.S. when she was 13 years old. In 2016, Gabriela launched Adelante, a seven-day college education summer program for undocumented students in the Hudson Valley. Gabriela will speak to us about the very real issues facing immigrants today. Please welcome Gabriela Quintanilla. One quick announcement, if um, other speakers who have not found me, please do so. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, how are you all doing? Let's make some noise. It is a true honor for me to be here with you all today. Um, as Eleanor Roosevelt once said, you gain strength, courage, and confidence by every experience in which you stop to look fear in the face. That is exactly what we're doing here today. We are here without fear in solidarity to defend our brothers and sisters, to defend this nation. We stand here today building a wall of love, compassion, and caring for others. We stand here with hope in our hearts because we know that it can move mountains and bring about change. I stand here today before you representing that immigrant community. Uh, uh, documented and undocumented. I came to this country 11 years ago as an undocumented immigrant from El Salvador. As a proud and beautiful uh, daughter of a strong woman who is an agricultural worker. I didn't know the language or how to navigate the American school system, but I work hard. I wanted an education more than anything, and most importantly, I wanted to contribute to this country in a positive way. I became a social justice activist by sharing my story and inspiring others to take action. I created a program to help high school undocumented students make it to college, and I continue to work hard side by side with the people who feed this nation, the people who feed the world, farm workers. Farm workers are often seen at the bottom of our food chain when in fact they stand at the beginning. These are the people that we don't often care to acknowledge when we are having a nice breakfast, lunch, or dinner. People who work hard to provide food for their families. People who love the land of this country even though they have been marginalized. Farm workers are not just Mexicans. They come from all over the world. El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, Ecuador, Jamaica, you name it. These people, my people, are not rapists, criminals, or uneducated. We are hardworking people who love this country and we want to contribute to it in a positive way because we know the potential it has as a nation uh, when it uses its power to, to do justice. I stand here today before you to talk about our current political climate with DACA, the DREAM Act, and TPS. I feel fortunate that I have been able to get permanent residency after many years of being in the shadows and living with tremendous anxiety and uncertainty of my future. I know that a lot of attention has been given to DACA uh, due to the fact that 800,000 people have been affected. Um, some people were able to renew their status and others were not. And just recently what we know is that a judge gave um, an announcement that people can renew their status now, um, people who have DACA. And, and that's, that's, a great, that's a great thing. However, the fight continues. Uh, there is thousands and thousands of people right now in D.C. advocating for a Clean Dream Act, a bill with no strings attached, a bill that is not going to use the dreams and hope of young people as leverage to build a wall and hire more Border Patrol agents. This nation, let us remember, this nation was built on the backs of immigrants. 
organization is great because of its diversity. We cannot forget the dreamers. We cannot forget that the dreamers have families too. And that their families did what they had to do to give their children a better future, a better life. They should not be punished. My mother should not be punished for wanting her daughters to have a better life away from war, poverty, and crime. Our families are the reason why we're, we're, we are who we are today. Our families are the real dreamers. My mother is the real dreamer, and she deserves full equality right here, right now. Taking away TPS is inhumane. Thousands of families are being affected and separated from loved ones. From loved ones. Why? Because we have a heartless, racist, xenophobic president. Woo! No Trump, no KKK, no racist USA. No Trump, no KKK, no racist USA. No Trump, no KKK, no racist USA. Just yesterday, I got a quote from a dear friend of mine who has been in D.C. since uh, Monday morning. Uh, he wants you all to know, we are not giving up regardless of what happens. We have come so far and we are not turning back. In D.C., still hundreds of dreamers and allies are still keeping the pressure on Congress to pass a Clean Dream Act. Us gathering here today is a symbol of progress. I truly believe that. It's a symbol of justice. We cannot be bystanders. We need to be people of action. We need to continue to show up no matter what. We have to come together to protect our human rights, to protect the rights of farm worker women, the rights of the undocumented students and their families, the rights of those who are being exploited because if not us, then who? And let, and let us remember always, it is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love each other and protect each other. We have nothing to lose but our change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabriella. Um, and I wanted to take a moment to thank our amazing interpreters, Dee Herrera and Angela Hauser. Thank you so much for being here.